Um, well, thanks for the opportunity to uh, discuss or present this evening to uh, your colleagues with the Royal Geographical Society of Queensland. Um, as is a practice at Binnabara, may I just uh, acknowledge and pay respects to the land and the traditional practices of the families of the Yugambeh language group in Southeast Queensland and their elders uh, uh, past, present and emerging. What we've done since the bushfires two and a half years ago is embarked on a, uh, uh, on a reconciliation action plan, which has been endorsed by Reconciliation Australia. And while tonight I'm going to focus a lot on the pre-colonial or the colonial era, post-colonial era history of Binnaburra, um, we have a renewed recognition of the tens of thousands of years of Indigenous connection to what we now call the Lamington National Park. And as we sort of reset and reimagine Binnaburra for the next 100 odd years of its life, um, it's very important for us that we recognise those connections and the histories and the stories of the, of the uh, First Nations people associated with, well, not just Lemington National Park, but the whole of the McPherson Ranges um, and the Yugambeh Language Group of, of South East Queensland. In the process of the Reconciliation Action Plan, actually, we've... Um, there's some very creative thinking that's come in to look at connecting art, Aboriginal art, to the storytelling about Binnaburra. And that's reflected even in the front cover of the Reconciliation Action Plan, where, can you see my icon, my little mouse, I mean, when I, when I move it, John? Yes, we can, Steve. So that's the access road coming into Binnaburra, uh, winds around, up past the Visitor Information Centre and the range is huts down there and it winds its way up here. This is where the big bushfire impact was, but, and the, and there's, and that's the, what we call the saddle, the open space and the campground where the lodge used to be there and the sky lodges. But those roads and those tracks and the various undulations are reflected in the artwork, um, which has been created by a wonderful guy called Tristan Schultz who's been driving this process for us. And we want to capture that in another initiative that we've just launched called the Arts, Nature and Science Program. And, and I noticed Dr. Renata Busiak is online here tonight also. So welcome, Renata. Renata is our artist in residence and has got a brilliant set of programs evolving at, at Binnaburra. A little bit disrupted with this current weather going on, but um, we've got some really interesting uh, approaches to connecting art, nature and science under Renata's leadership also. So what I, wanted, I thought I'd take the opportunity to chat about tonight was a proposition that I, that I have, and then start to paint the picture with some contextual issues about why Queensland is Queensland, and especially the state border, because uh, McPherson Ranges, Lamington National Park are on the state border. So the fact that there's a border is very significant in the, um, in the storytelling about Binnaburra and also in the history and storytelling about the Geographical Society and other organisations. Um, and then I'll make some comments about Binnaburra and the Black Summer bushfires and finish off with an idea to present to the society. Uh, and some perhaps some other partners also. So my proposition is that although Binnaburra formally started with activities in 1933, its story actually goes back to at least 1885 in the beginnings of the Royal Geographical Society of Queensland because of the types of people who are involved in getting the the, the, the geographic society up and running, and those before it also, and that many people associated with the Royal Geographical Society of Queensland, especially the president in 1896, but many people before and after the turn of the century from the 1800s to the 1900s, were involved in the sorts of issues and knowledge creation that was um, crossed over with the people and the energy that created 
not just for Lamington National Park, but 15, 18 years later, um, Binnaburra Lodge. And in particular, that the work and the contributions of Robert Martin Collins, which are recognized in many places, um, but my sense is it's all very localized to scenic rim area. And there's a bigger picture for Queensland in terms of his contributions to the fact that we have national parks in Queensland. And that and my argument is that his contribution deserves renewed and enlarged recognition. So I mentioned the border issue is a significant one. And, and I, you know, as I was putting my thoughts together for this presentation tonight, I, I looked at some old maps of this concept or the ideas of Queensland. And back in 1838, where there was this uh, thinking from a Captain James Vetch, who published in the Royal Geographical Society Journal back in 1838, um, the idea was to try and be fair and equitable as much as possible and have a, a series of states in this great big continent so that they could all have a bit of coastal area and places where they could have harbours. It's interesting, back in 1838, look where he thought Tasmania would be up there in the Kimberley and Victoria would be over in Perth area. Um, and, and he had there was some interesting concepts there. The a decade later, there was thinking that maybe the northern half of Australia should be cut off as a separate entity, and a border could come in Queensland around Fraser Island Way and go across. And then that evolved into another bit of thinking in a, a decade later in 1851 about having a very large northern area called Cook's Land, which started from the Clarence River area, Grafton uh, North. But to, to consolidate this notion of, of having a state, the then governor of New South Wales, Denison, um, instructed that a boundary should be researched and should follow somewhere around the Cape Danger area and follow that range of hills which separate that Grafton Clarence River area from the new settlement at Morton Bay, Brisbane area and continue along a ridge. So they knew the ridge was there, which we call McPherson Ranges, and that should, um, uh, until it got to the 29th parallel and then continued westward to uh, where it pretty much ends up now. And one of the contentious issues has been where actually was Cape Danger or Point Danger? And the bit of confusion, some of you will be aware of this, between what Captain Cook put in his reports and what others thought. So there's different schools of thoughts about what where Cook had actually identified Cape Danger, was it around the Fingal Head area or the Snapper Rocks area? And then ultimately um, the, where it is now, the Snapper Rocks area and the Coolangatta Tweed Heads area is where the, the border was uh, started. But it, it, um, it was an area of debate for some time and in, in, in relatively recent times actually too. But nevertheless, um, in 1859, the Queen Victoria gave approval to get a new colony of Queensland, which put a little bit of extra pressure on to define exactly where it was. And then in the 1859, when Queensland was established, the Western boundary was put in a particular location and adjusted um, a decade in the next decade. And then there were other adjustments around Australia. We ended up in 1911 with what we've got now. Those determining where that boundary goes, and this is this is important because this determines where why the McPherson Ranges and Lamington National Park are in Queensland and not somewhere else. These 
competing, almost competing surveyors uh, were given the task to define the border and, uh, and that border work that they did, both Francis Roberts and Rowland, um, the, the path that they walked is, is now part of the uh, border track that links Binnaburra and O'Reilly's. And people who walk that track, that 21 k's now, actually following the steps of these of these the survey work from the 1860s and that track that they determined then is actually now the you know the key sort of uh, backbone of the very significant walking track access that lamington national park has and that's part of the reason why lamington national park is one of the more significant national parks in queensland is it because of that network of tracks that has its heritage back in the work of Roberts and Rowland. And where the Benabara Lodge was located, um, that piece of land is actually called Mount Roberts after Francis Roberts from his survey work uh, at the time. When these guys were doing their survey work, there was enormous uh, pressure on for the belt to harvest, harvest the resources of the state. And there was a, an attitude that was very much about um, humans versus the environment and the elements. And it was a struggle in the wilderness and no doubt that struggle reflected on indigenous communities also, but the, you know, the, um, the sense that the all conquering uh, dominant white male species from the empires were going to needed to battle their way through these foreign natural elements and create a new civilization it was very much a, you know an attitude of exploitation of resources in the land that they had come to and there was a growing colony of course in the Morton Bay area there was a need for timber uh, and agricultural land and so we can see back in the year that the Royal Geographical Society was formed in 1885 already there was pressures on for large scale residential land allocations in places like Bow Desert, which were, you know, where, which were access points to all these other beautiful timber resources that were uh, in the areas like the McPherson Ranges. And this is where Mr. Collins comes into the picture. Um, Robert Collins was a man of wealth uh, from cattle industry in particular, and also land holdings around what we now know as the scenic rim and the first and ranges area. Um, but he had made a trip to the US in 1878, and this is 20 odd years before he was president of the Royal Geographical Society of Queensland. And he'd, he'd, he'd He'd been an observer of what the Americans had done with this new concept of national parks with Yellowstone. He didn't actually get to Yellowstone, but he did visit the Yosemite Valley. Um, and that was 12 years before it was declared a national park in the Sierra Nevada. But he was a keen student of what the Americans were doing to start to conserve forests and was aware that there was something special in Queensland, especially in the first and ranges, that potentially could be destroyed if the if the development, the level of development that they were looking at or experiencing was going to continue. So these McPherson ranges have been identified, talked about for for a long time in the 1800s by in by colonial explorers and um, who, who were basing a lot of their initial exploration of the sightings that Cook had done when he sailed up the coast in the late 1700s. And because of such a dominant view from the coast with Mount Warning sticking up, and, and then the ridge from the coast is very plain to see. And the... Um, uh, young 
Patrick Logan is interesting. All these guys are very interesting characters and you could do a story on each one of them, but Logan in particular, who was only 39 when he passed away, but he, he named the McPherson Rangers um, after a buddy of his who had been uh, a member of the Scottish uh, military wing of the British Army. And actually Major Duncan McPherson had an interesting history and story to tell in the colonies and the battles in the United States. But that's another story for another day. Another key character in all this, in all this storytelling is Lord Lamington, um, who addressed the Royal Geographical Society of Queensland on a few occasions. Um, and, in, and at the time when Robert Collins was the president of the association, of the society. And Collins used the opportunity to advocate for the Southern Highlands of Queensland, including the McPherson Ranges or built around the McPherson Ranges to be a special area where um, the, to make sure that if the purpose of, ex, of, of the explorers and exploration was to open up new land for agriculture and for timber getting, that there was also another agenda that could be objective. And that was a, a, an agenda of conservation um, of the of this what he was increasingly thinking was uh, some special sort of landscapes so in 1889 collins took the governor of lamington up to the lamington plateau and that was a very significant trip for him to take a powerful person like the governor collins had a lot of political antennas about him he um, he, he knew how to use his wealth and influence and got himself elected to the Queensland Legislative Assembly uh, in the 1890s, the same time when, at the beginning when he was president of the Royal Geographical Society. Um, he, only last, he only stayed a couple of years in that role. He was invited back in 1913 to the Legislative Council only for a very short time because he passed away. But um, he knew how to get things done and how to shape laws. And that's what he did in terms of helping to uh, get a national park structure in, into Queensland. That paper um, on called A Trip to the Southeastern Highlands of Queensland was presented to the society and there's one of the great things about the Royal Geographical Society of Queensland is the marvellous records that are kept and for those of us who are history buffs or are students of this sort of history there's wonderful stuff you can plow through and so I appreciate all the great records and archives that the society does keep. So Collins had argued for about 20 odd years for the McPherson Ranges to have some form of conservation uh, or in a legal sense, um, wrapped around it. He was joined by a young fellow called Romeo Lay in 1911, and who worked with him to petition because um, Collins sadly passed away before two years before the National Park was declared. There were opponents in politics about declaring it a national park, this new idea of a national park, and they challenged Collins to get signatures from local communities. It was the local government authority included Tambourine, what we now call Mount Tambourine in those days. And, and, and Lay did that. Um, Lay actually wanted the name of the national park to be the original name, Wunungora, not the not named after a colonial governor at Lamington. In fact, there's evidence of letters we've got when Romeo was fighting the, in the Western Front in the First World War, he was still writing letters to the forestry minister trying to have the name changed from, from Lamington to Wardengora. Um, as it turned out, 1920, um, which was uh, nine, nine years after Robert Collins had passed away, Romeo actually married Alice Delprat, who was the goddaughter of, of R.M. Collins. And Young Romeo Lay, and this is a, 
the the state library has some of Romeo's beautiful old black and white photos. This is from 1910 when Romeo was doing the, the modern technology of glass slides. And he started to take photographs of the Lamington National Park, which are just stunning images which are kept in the, uh, in the John Ox Oxley Library. And, and those visual images would have been very powerful in terms of the lobbying processes to finally get on the 31st of July, 1915, Queensland's ninth national park declared, which was of course the Lamington National Park. Just before the First World War, um, Romeo Lay also addressed the Royal Geographical Society of Australasia, as it was. And there's some wonderful, many wonderful quotes, one of which was that only a very stolid, soulless sort of human creature can go unmoved amongst the big trees. And we can still enjoy those big trees today because of the work of people like Collins and Lay. Just before the Lamington National Park was gazetted, um, just only five days before that, Romeo actually listed in the uh, military and was called off to Europe. He departed Australia in 1916 as a second lieutenant and he served in the Western Front and was promoted uh, to lieutenant. He was also wounded um, in, in battle. Uh, and he spent time after the war in London, where with, he had three, there were three LA boys fought in the First World War and his sister Vita, who was a renowned Queensland artist, had set up a, a home basically in London in the fence so where the brothers and the sisters could connect um, in London. And he also, when he was in London, took the opportunity to do some town planning education and bring some of those skills back to planning tracks and roads in the McPherson Ranges and other areas when he returned. While the war was on, back home, we started to see the emergence of promotional material about Lamington National Park. And the Queensland Pictorial Magazine, a little one that I found from 1916, um, has one set of pages about the war and then the next set of pages about the beauties of Lamington National Park. There's a really interesting, you know, um, comparison between the conflicts and the world's problems and then also um, using, you know, balancing that against the beauties of nature. Seems to me things haven't changed a real lot, actually, 2022. There's some things going on around the world now. But, um, you know, people were starting to be encouraged or becoming aware of these natural attractions. But the big challenge they had was, of course, was access. How do they get access to these places? Let me introduce now the next character in this little narrative. There are many characters, so I only picked a couple of them. But Arthur Groom is a significant player in, this, in the storytelling tonight. And he first came as a young man at 23 years of age, early 20s, over to the uh, Raleigh side of the Lamington National Park for holiday. He actually ended up being the company secretary of O'Reilly's for a short period of time. And he first came up to the Binnabar area, which was a farm owned by a guy called George Rankin, who was also a First World War I veteran. And he walked up to the top of Mount Roberts where the lodge used to be. And he had an idea that if only some wealthy person could be induced to provide access and provide a tourist center. The same year he met Romeo Lay. Now that Romeo's, you know, relative wealth, I guess, for that time from their timber industry um, days, but also Romeo had stature as a war veteran and a highly regarded person in the, in the sort of social networks and the, uh, of the, of the greater Brisbane area. So that was a good coming together of those people. Many of you all know Groom's Cottage at Benabar. And nowadays we, we have it as a wonderful little bushwalkers bar. 
Arthur probably wouldn't have liked that because I understand he was a teetotaler and he'd probably be curling his eyes right now knowing that we're selling a nice cold beer on tap in the, in the house, in the house. But the key thing here is that Romeo and Arthur got together with many others, but they were the leading forces to form in 1930, the National Parks Association of Queensland. And they brought influential people around them to, jo to help with that. And many of them were connected already with the Royal Geographical Society of Queensland. The patron was the governor, Sir John Goodwin, the vice presidents, James Duhigg, of course, and, and, and Professor Goddard from UQ. And these were people of you know, influence in the community of, of the colony, especially in, in the greater Brisbane area. But anybody's interested in a bit more background on that, last year I was fortunate enough to do the Romeo Lane Memorial Lecture at Brisbane City Hall, and there's a little bit of history there that tracks that sort of linkage. When the National Parks Association of Queensland was formed, that was the same year that Queensland had its first Native Queens Protection Act. And that act enabled the appointment of honorary rangers by the minister of the day to help police the legislation to protect the environment. And lo and behold, in September 1931, Romeo Lay was the first honorary ranger appointed under that act. And the back in those days, of course, the, the number of known native species was relatively well, it was pretty substantial, really, with over 7,700 for the time. And when you consider the methods that they had for collecting, researching, collecting and doing field work, but now it's going up around 15,000 in, uh, in Queensland. And we, and, and that's, you know, that, that cons that's all part of the message of conservation, I guess. Um, in the, in, what, in the story I'm trying to shape out here tonight. I'm getting there, stay with me. I've got an end story here that we're aiming towards. So if we've got these wonderful places and these wonderful organizations established, the, and people wanted to go, how do they get there? They needed roads, they needed transportation, they needed somewhere to sleep, they needed access points. And this is where the idea of forming a sort of a social enterprise, if you wish. I call it Australia's first crowdfunded nature tourism resort. And it was originally called Queensland Holiday Resorts and, uh, and is now it's known as Binnaburra Lodge. So in 1933 in the Courier Mail in Brisbane, one of the early ideas and from a photo you can see there was a Blue Mountains type country lodge, mountain lodge. And they were looking for funds from people to invest in this new idea and and with the agreement of George Rankin, who had at that stage finally agreed to sell the land to this new company. Romeo had actually asked him back in 1920, 13 years before, and Arthur had the same idea 10 years later, and then they came together and went back to George Rankin, who finally said, okay, I'll let you have that piece of land for my farm for this crazy new idea called Queensland Holiday Resorts. Queensland Holiday Resorts idea was not just Binnabar, it was about, it was about having access places for people irrespective of their socioeconomic background that they could access these new protected areas around the state of Queensland. Um, now the contributions of people like Romeo Lay, you know, enormously significant. This is, this is a photograph which is very similar to where I live actually from my house. I can almost do that same shot now 110 years later, but that land around um, uh, courage or Egg Rock is in the English language, that was Romeo Lay's private land and he donated 212 acres of that land to help expand the National Park in 1933 at the same time that they were pulling together the interest and the resources to form Binnaburra Lodge. Now there's lots and lots of people associated with Binnaburra who are also cross over their interests with the Royal Geographical Society, the Naturalist Society, the, the um, National Parks Association. I'll just, just a couple of them, just to, just to illustrate the depth in the, of the skills and the commitment um, and the scientific basis for 
the foundations of Benabar. Um, Henry Richards, uh, many of you will be familiar with the geology building at the in, at UQ at the St. Lucia campus and his enormous contribution to Queensland. Um, he attended the very first bush camp or camp at Binnaburra in, in the middle of 1933. Next year in 2023, in June next year, we'll do a reenactment of that camp. Um, it'll be what's 70 plus 90 year, 90 year anniversary of that camp is something that we'll pull together and try and get some of the old they used old uh, World War I surplus tents. And I've been in contact with the Australian Military Museum to see if we can get one of those, and we can. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to do something significant there in, in 2023 for the 90th year anniversary. But um, apart from Henry, who was a, an initial shareholder and served on the board of Binnaburra, Ted Marks, Ted Marks' story is just amazing, his contribution to Queensland and to Australia, and also to the formation of Binnaburra, and he served as a company director right through from the early 30s to the mid to the late 1970s. Um, David Kroll, who was a former chairman of the board of Binnaburra, these were people of you know, enormous character and commitment to their communities. Just, and, and, and these are a bunch of people, you know, they had World Wars, World War One, and then World War Two, and a big depression in the middle. And then they helped form this thing called the National Parks Association of Queensland. And out of that grew the first 97 shareholders for Benbara Lodge. And in a very difficult time in the history, but they, you know, they had the big picture about conservation of our landscapes at the top of their minds. I'm going to jump now to um, the Black Summer bushfires in uh, two and a half years ago. We, you, you know, it was a bad time two and a half years ago in Australia when we had these terrible fires and there's you know, lots of impacts on people, on places, on wildlife. And for six months, we had fires raging right around the country. Um, at the beginning of that period, in August, early September, uh, what became later known as Black Summer, uh, we had the, the fires that ultimately destroyed Levitt Houses and, and Binnaburra Lodge in the Beachmont Lamington National Park area. There'd been some very good assessment done of that fire uh, by various parties, which started in a, the fire started in a place called Sarabar, for those of you who know Sarabar near Kadungra. Um, that particular fire lasted for 24 weeks. Uh, six months and I remember actually in January we first had fires in August and then in January we got about 100 mil of rain one night and that was the first night that the air cleared and I knew that after six months that we'd passed our bushfire uh, intensity in, in the Laming, on the Binnaburra side of Lamington National Park but the um, the mapping, the mapping of the fire and its path is there's some very good science um, that we can learn from. And when we track where the severity and intensity was, um, often it comes down to that little patch where Binnaburra was, where the lodge used to be. Uh, so we're going to show just a little video now just to uh, have a break from my voice. And also, um, just to give you a snapshot um, of what happened two and a half years ago, I've been about John, I'm going to hand back to you and get you to share the video you're in. Is that right? Correct. Can everyone see that okay? Yep. There we go. Can everyone hear that? Can't hear it. There we go. Knew we'd hit, we'd hit some issue. No audio yet. Yeah. Plan B was as we share back to me, and I'll I'll play it off YouTube. 
if you want to give that one a go, yeah. Okay. So can you stop share? Yep. And I'll screen share. No, I've got to share with me. Okay, if you just want to share your screen there, Steve. Now we're going good. Yep, you can see in here fine. These gusting winds that firefighters are worried about. They've been in this area between Binnaburra and Beechmont for three days now. The smoke is almost unbearable as they try and stop this blaze tearing up the escarpment and into properties on the hill. Wind gusts of up to 70 kilometres an hour grounded water bombers, but earlier they were out, desperate to get a handle on the unpredictable situation. With rugged, impassable terrain, it's the only way to curb these flames. With the fire still burning out of control in Binnaburra and westerly winds forecasts, authorities are worried the fire could move closer to the Gold Coast in the coming days. 200 firefighters, police and volunteers all battling on in the toughest of conditions. It's a sad sight for the generations who've known Binnaburra Lodge the 86-year-old National Park Retreat is a tourism icon, parts of it on the heritage list. It was evacuated on Friday night and this morning engulfed by fire. That represents nine decades of Binnaburra in, in, as a physical item as of today. That's one car. The lodge's chairman is sleeping in the back of a truck and could lose his home. So I haven't had much time to think about the house yet, but... Um... It's, it's, it's. There's only one road leading in and out of Binnaburra Lodge, and it's referred to as a corridor of risk. Firefighters had to retreat due to the dangers of the burning trees and unpredictable wind. Even for the firefighters who believe it's unsafe to be trying to get in without the risk of getting trapped. It is a piece of our cultural heritage and unfortunately it has succumbed to uh, devastation by the fires. Across Queensland, more than 80 fires are burning. 47 properties have been damaged with 12 completely destroyed. And the historic Binnaburra Lodge, nestled within rainforest in the Gold Coast hinterlands, has burned down. It is an historic event. We've never seen fire danger indices, fire danger ratings at this time of the year as we're seeing now. Never seen this before in recorded history. The blaze which engulfed the Gold Coast hinterland started amongst drier gum trees. It also destroyed the heritage listed Binnaburra retreat and surrounding vegetation many thought to be safe from fire. Authorities say the recent disasters in New South Wales and Queensland make it clear rainforest fires are no longer a rarity. We have probably seen these kind of events before and uh, the climate record tells us that. But the climate scientists tell us they're going to get more and more frequent. 
we can expect them more often, fires like that far more often, and we can expect fires that we've never experienced before and we won't know what to do with them. Staff from Binnaburra Lodge have set up temporary accommodation at Beachmont, cancelling bookings for the months ahead. And it was the darkest day in the history of Binnaburra and for many people who know Binnaburra, so it's just horrific. Winds are supposed to increase further later tonight, putting everyone on edge. We have the Prime Minister Scott Morrison and Federal Minister David Littleproud coming from emergency services. We also have the, the leader of the state opposition and we're taking a convoy up to the Lunaburra site for the Federal Government to do an inspection. see the damage on this sky lodge here. This took the full brunt of the fire coming up this way. But it's very interesting, this fire took the top area. The bottom unit is actually still quite intact. And, but the energy of the fire was pulled right down. And you can see then on the next unit, in fact, there's no impact at all from the fire. So those three sky lodges look okay. And they need to be checked still, of course. But these buildings, have been extremely well designed for this environment in terms of the fire risk. We did learn a lot of lessons about how to design and build uh, accommodation in this environment. Experience. Out of this rubble, we'll come something new for, for Binnaburra. Big, wide Binnaburra families from around the world. But it's interesting sitting here today, we've got the resurgence of spot fires right around the valley. There's still a lot of smoke. We're heading into some very severe uh, heat and wind conditions this weekend. So we're not out of the danger zone yet. This is on Friday, Friday after the Sunday fire. And there's still a lot of work to be done by emergency services this coming weekend to make sure that we can protect what's, what's remaining here in Bedford. <laughs> Discovery forest for the kids. That got a fair bit of damage. And that, that's a historic old sign, a very popular sign. That's right. The road is the big issue, uh, when, and that's probably a month or two, maybe longer away, getting that secured. When we get when we get access, then we can start moving this because we need trucks in and out. Um, and then we we can start the business because the tea, what we call the tea house at the trailheads up the, further up, and the campground is, is good, so we can start again. And then down here with our sky lodges, which are below that hill there, yep. there's three quarters of those are okay, and then more uh, uh, upscale type accommodation. So we got something to start with. And then we actually did a master plan eight, 10 years ago, 
And along this ridge here was actually the car park goes, we put cabins along there. But because of the insurance was quite low, because nobody would touch it with fire risk, so forth, um, the money from the insurance would just stay at the site. So we've got to refine, got to refine find it. ways to refinance here. Yeah. But do that, but we'll do something. Um, but we'll start off in 1933, the place started as a camping place. In December 16, 1933 was the first summer camp for two months. Um, and um, we want, if we can get on site, we want to do a reenactment of that. And that's how we'll start Dinnerboro like it started 86 years ago as a camping place and build it up from there. So these gone one to for us about three, 400 million years old. 172 years of Dinnerboro is a very small time. And we're halfway through the journey. First 86 years is finished and where we're planning for the next 86 years. But we can do it better because we have better knowledge and better, better standards for building in this environment. So, so. But we'll do it. Once you get a cabin, we'll come and stay. We've got one <laughs> left. We've got one left. Just down here on the left. There's one left. You can stay. So Okay, John, am I back online okay? Yep, we can see in here, there's you and the screen fine. That's great. So, um, we've had a very interesting last couple of years with the bushfires, and then we've all had to deal with COVID. And then in the last few days, this rain bomb that's hit Japanese Queensland and now moving its way down into New South Wales, we had to close Binabara yesterday and today and again tomorrow. The first time we've shut the business down since the bushfires. We were closed for a year after the bushfires and um, we managed, like everybody who had to manage the issues with COVID. Um, and that has a bigger impact on our staffing than on the customers, quite really. Um, and now, of course, we've had to shut the business down again. This, just in the last couple of days. So, you know, it gives, it's, um, it's a tough gig, isn't it, for everybody? So anyway, we'll bounce back. Like, we'd, like people have been doing a bit of for the last 100 years. Um, and, you know, I often reflect upon the resilience of these sort of characters like Robert Martin Collins and the Romeo Lays and the Arthur Grooms and all those people who have been associated with a place like Benabara for, you know, for a long, long time. Um, but let me share an idea I would like to get the support of the society on in relation to Robert Martin Collins. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the All Saints Memorial Church at Otemuka in the scenic rim. And it goes back to 1915 when the Collins... Actually, we've got... Um, there's digital copies of the, of the will that's, that Robert Collins signed and where he uh, allocates funds for the land where the church is. And now, now the toads, like for those who are not too familiar with it, the south of Bow Desert on the way to Rat Downey, uh, Christmas Creek area is in there. And then you head up into the Lamington National Park. It's a gorgeous old church. Um, and in that churchyard is the resting place of Robert Martin Collins. There is a burial stone there with some, um, nice words on it and the the trust the trustees of the all saints memorial church uh the responsible party for the church and um uh, it's a registered with the australian not-for-profits and charities commission it's a registered charity the that the trustees operate to look after the property so this is the idea we jump ahead 18 months which is takes us to uh, 2023, which is the 90 year anniversary of Binabar. Um, if we reflect next year on that time, on the 110 year anniversary of the passing of Robert Martin Collins, that I have this vision that we have the governor of Queensland, who's also the patron of the Royal Geographical Society and also the patron of the National Parks Association, 
unveiling some appropriate form of memorial, either at Penrupin, at the church grounds. Obviously, that would need the approval of the trustees. And I've had preliminary chat with the trustees, one of the trustees. Uh, or, and, and if that wasn't suitable, there could be another suitable location in the scenic room to recognise and celebrate the contribution of Robert Martin Collins to the establishment of the concept and the legislation for national parks in Queensland, and in particular, the Lamington National Park. I see it as a wonderful opportunity for a partnership between the society and the NPAQ. Um, I'm the vice chairman of the uh, National Parks Association of Queensland. And then we have it officially opened by our joint patron, uh, the Honourable Dr. Janet Young. Um, and, I, and, and if the idea was something that the society um, would come on board with, it would be great. From a National Parks Association of Queensland point of view, I flagged this idea during the Romeo Lay Memorial Lecture last year at Brisbane City Hall. We had about 100 people in the audience. Many of them knew Romeo Lay very well and some of his relatives were there. They were very supportive of the idea. Um, so if the idea has got some merit, um, you know, this is just a rough staging process. Um, the first stage we're at now is to introduce an idea to the Society and the National Parks Association. We've done it with the National Parks, now it's an opportunity with the Royal Geographical Society of Queensland. Um, in, uh, uh, in the next month or so, get an in-principle agreement between the Society and the National Parks Association. Once the idea in principle is agreed, then we work on a bit more detail in a concept paper with some rough examples and, and a preliminary sort of cost options. Um, could be some people interested to volunteer some services on this. And then a next stage, number four, would be to reach out to the trustees and uh, gauge and present them with something that's at a sort of concept paper uh, level. And then the next stage five in June would be to take that concept paper and fine tune it a bit another level to get the location suggested, initial design, design concepts and costings, run the idea past the city, uh, city Green Regional Council um, make connections with the Department of Heritage and get, the, get their blessing and perhaps involvement. And then work in the beginning of the new financial year for a few months to look at how it's all going to be funded from public or private sector. I don't know what the concept is going to look like and how much it's going to cost, but you know, this could be in between $20,000 and $200,000 or more. Depends on how it's scoped out. And then towards the end of the year, commission the work. And then early next year, 2023, is to do all those steps that are needed to have it all ready for a dedication ceremony on the 16th of August, 2023, um, for that 110 year anniversary of the passing of Robert Martin Collins. And that, Mr. President of the Royal Geographical Society of Queensland is the end of my presentation. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Steve. That has been a fascinating look through the connections and the history and up to the present day as well. Um, what we'll throw to you now, uh, as we always do with these sessions, is any questions, queries from the, those listening on online. If you want to throw your question into the chat, Please do. If not, um, welcome to ask away. Given the uh, ongoing silence there, I might kick off, Steve. Um, you know, obviously it's been a frantic and at times challenging past few years. What do you see as some of the biggest wins and achievements you've made since 2019? Um, keeping Binnaburra solvent, <laughs> which we've achieved. Um, in fact, we've grown the business, which is great. 
And, you know, I think the key thing, what we've been able to do as a team is just harness the emotional connections that so many generations of so many families have had with Binnabarra. And, you know, when the when Romeo Lay and Arthur Green set it up, or led the setting up of it in 1933, they wrote into the constitution, it's an unlisted public company, that nobody could ever own more than two and a half percent of the shares. And before the bushfires, nobody owned more than one percent of the shares. We had about 800 shareholders, you know, all, all, all small shareholders. And then in the last, we're just about finishing a 12 month offer information statement. So for the first time in the company's history, there's been an active a, a, um, a effort to bring in new shareholders and we're about 1,200 now. But of, the, of those, um, you know, only a very small number have, have more than 1% of the shares. Um, and, the, and, you know, 90% of those shareholders have got less than 5,000 invested and uh, more than almost 60% have 500 or $1,000 invested. So it's, we've kept the spirit of, of giving, of making it the business accessible to those who love the place and want to be part of its stewardship and hand it on to future generations. And, um, and just that support that we've had, at, and, at, and even at the, at the local, state and federal level, you know, since the fire, we've, we've had support in cash terms for various things, totaling, uh, as of last week, $6 million. We got an extra $2 million last week on a bushfire recovery. And, and then from the shareholders with the share raise, just last month, we, with $1 shares, at 500 shares minimum, which closes in a four weeks time, we've raised almost $1.1 million. And then we need more rooms. And the only way we could finance the room was to ask people for loans. And 10 people so far have given us $100,000 loans um, to build tiny wild houses. So when you add up the, the public sector funds support for Binnabara and the private support, that's about $8 million. And that's just fantastic, you know, that, that people would do that and have faith that, you know, we're, we're going to, we've made this place survive and now, and we're, we're going to re, regrow a different version of the same spirit for the next 86 years. And the focus has been on their hard infrastructure, the roads, the water, the power, the buildings, all that stuff that you need. And we've also now just shifted our focus a bit now with what I call the soft infrastructure. And that's where with the, we've been very fortunate to have Renata join in as a wonderful volunteer and contributor as an artist in residence and harness the bringing back of that connection with arts and nature on the site. So that's the spirit of Binnabara that's, you know, coming back in strongly and it's just been wonderful to see how, with all the dramas with COVID and you know, the rain bomb in the last few days um, going on, that you know we're positive and advancing. For those of, those who are joining us tonight, who'd like to know about the numbers before the bushfire, we had the company it, owner's equity was about four point two million. Now, after a bushfire, after COVID. The net value is about one, 5.1 million, and that's undervalued because land prices on beach bond have gone up about 40% in the last 12 months. And our management rights for the sky lodges is totally undervalued because we're running, we've been running over 90% over occupancy for the last six or eight months. So the business, the business is uh, probably better now than it's ever looked, quite frankly, which is remarkable, just remarkable. So we've got a really good foundation to shape a new spirit of Binnaburra, which pays respect to the legacy of those before in Whitefella time. We want to extend that for tens of thousands of years before with the Reconciliation Action Plan and make Binnaburra you know, a major contributor to people learning and appreciating the natural environment for many generations to come. No, I think that's 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 kind of like that sounds like an election speech, and I? I should say vote <laughs> one for Steve. <laughs> no, no, I think that very much speaks to what those emerging, emerging opportunities are and where op, future oper, 
options and opportunities for collaboration might lead. Uh, we've got a few questions now coming through. I might throw to Chris's question first up. How did Binnaburra get its name? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, actually, it was one of the early shareholders who suggested it. Um, um, oh, gee, I know the answer to this. <laughs> and I've got it written down. Um, but it was proposed by one of the early shareholders and um, in the 1930s. And obviously it's got connections to in one of the indigenous language groups. From what we can understand, see, we didn't have a lot of knowledge about the indigenous cultural connections with that landscape. Um, so an example, 12 years ago, when the sky lodges were being built, part of the process you've got to do a um, you know cultural impacts assessment. There was very little data to draw on, which is part of the reason the reconciliation action plan is useful because it helps us put more focus on collecting information. So there's different language groups in the area, or might have crossed over, had different meanings for the words binabar. Um, from what we can gather with the indigenous communities and the languages that were used was that. There, our current knowledge is there wasn't a lot of permanent dwellings of Indigenous communities in the mountains because the resources they needed for their livelihoods were in the valleys where the rivers and on the coast, that's where the resources were. The mountains were places of ceremony rather than places of dwelling. Um, and so you had groups that came in and out. And so you get different, different interpretations of the words Binabar in depending on which language group might have come in related to water and place and trees and those sorts of things. But the church, the selection of the name was done by one of the early shareholders and it's one of those significant people who are very active in, in um, you know, the, the leading lights of what would have, well, University of Queensland was the only university, I think at the time, wasn't it, in the 30s? So there was a lot of connection with the scientific community at UQ. In fact, the very first camp in 1930s, the very first group that came in 1933 was a group from the University of Queensland. Um, in fact, the very first group that booked out with the rain bob two days ago was a group from the University of Queensland too. Uh, history repeats, huh? <laughs> As it always does sometimes. I think we've got the yeah. next question. Not really a question, but a comment, but I'm sure it generates a question, which is obviously a tremendous amount of, tremendous amount of research has gone into all of this, Steve. When can we expect to see uh, this detailed history published? Um, so what's, what's the question? I'm just uh, more, more of the one here from uh, Ralph about the tremendous amount of research that's been done and uh, asking here, uh, when can we expect it to be published? <laughs> well, you know what, just putting this, thinking about how I was gonna present this tonight. Um, I've, I've got, I've, you know, you, you should well know, you. You, you do a bit of research and you, wow, that's interesting and off you go. So I think over the next couple of years, I might have to um, keep working on this. It's very interesting. And uh, um, um, those of you who know Binabar might know that a guy called Harry Throttle wrote a book in 1985. It's got a beautiful green cover on it, which was the history of Binabar from the 30s up to the 1985. We've always needed somebody to write another book from the 18, for the last 35, 40 years, the history of Benabara. And increasingly that's looking like me. Um, so this could be my passion project for the next few years um, is, to, is to continue this quite interesting angle. Because you know, this, you know, it's the old story. How, how can you learn from history? You learn from history because somebody documents and presents that history in a way that is of interest to new audiences. And we've got to get that story over the last 100 years, plus the indigenous stories from tens of thousands of years, and use, use the digital era to communicate it to future generations who live online and don't know what a and, don't, and probably in their life, or probably never read a book. 
a hardcover book. I read an online book. And so we can, and the other good thing about that, if you have a bushfire, you don't lose all your books, it's online. Um, so there are some advantages there. So um, I, think, I think what we'll probably do over the next couple of years is have a whole series of packages of information and history about Benavarra, past and more, more contemporary, and package it up as digital um, groups and then, and then you can put all those digital bits together and end up with a fairly substantial online history. And it's cheaper to produce than printing a book too. Well, I look forward to seeing it come through. Uh, we have a question here from the Lowry's um, about how did the fire start at Sarabar? Very good question. Um, two and a half years ago, two months after the bushfires, the official police report was that a couple of teenagers dropped the cigarette butts and the wind got behind it and it went north first and then it turned around and came south um, and worked its way over a week or so down to ultimately hitting Beachmont and Benamborough. Last month, an ABC Freedom of Information investigation came up with an alternative view, which was that the uh, cause of the fire was a shooting range by some people uh, an ad hoc shooting range um, and sparks from that may have started the fire. So the initial police report is a, um, has one version and two and a half years later, there's another version that I'm still digesting. Well, I'm sure we will continue to learn the lessons from 2019 and hopefully we can avoid those circumstances into the future. Uh, we have a comment here from uh, Raphne. Uh, just thank you for the presentation there, Steve, and uh, all the content you've presented tonight. And of course, looking forward to what opportunities we might have into the future. I, I, I agree, we will definitely be discussing uh, the options around the Collins Memorial uh, quite soon at the next RGSQ Council and looking to members as well for what options they see moving forward. Um, we've got our last one here for the night, a question from Neil uh, about how do you record the ongoing daily, weekly progress um, so that people in the future know about what's happened? Um, thank you for that, uh, Neil. The, um, the best way is we're doing it really is, um, in a, is a digital form because of social media posts um, with you know, the Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, there's, there's a lot of content that tracks and is, goes online. Um, also, because we've been fortunate enough with many, many submissions, some, some we, we're successful with, some we're not successful with, but because of the success we've had with some of the funding grants, and the reporting mechanisms that are required under those grants, especially when there's public funds involved, um, you necessarily keeping good records and reports there. So we've, we've been able to, um, well, in the response and recovery first 12 months of the bushfires, we've documented a lot of material, which has now been transferred into book chapters um, with, and we connected with the research community earlier on, got, got data collected while it was fresh. Um, and, you know, we, we built, we always had a strong relationship with universities. What we've done this time is uh, Griffith University is sort of lead university partner, but we deal with many universities and many topics. But there's a growing body of literature that's emerged in terms of disaster recovery and resilience that relates to the Benabara case study. Um, and um, uh, I've cut authored a couple of chapters in a few books already myself, but there are others who've done things with our blessing. And so, in fact, there are UQ and Canberra University, Purdue University in the US, just examples now where case studies in textbooks are being used, Benabara is the case study for you know, tourism response and recovery. And then just last week, on behalf of the Australian government, DFAT invited me to address an APEC tourism disaster conference, which was hosted by the government of Japan. 
And, you know, we're, we're, and because we're being invited to do those th sorts of things, it means that we're documenting and presenting um, the story, the contemporary story. Because, you know, the, the history of Benabara has got two, two starting points now, the early 1930s and the Black Summer bushfires. And, you know, we're acutely aware that we're building a new knowledge foundation. And this new knowledge foundation is a digital one. So if another bloody bushfire comes, we can just, we're not going to lose all the wonderful records that we lost in the bushfires in 2019. Well, that sounds certainly like a fascinating and hopefully more secure pathway forward to keep this story continuing. Indeed. And it will. I'm sure it will. Well, with that, Steve, we might wrap up for tonight. And uh, we will certainly be communicating and uh, continuing our ongoing collaboration over the coming weeks, months, and years, I hope. Yeah, looking forward to it. And they're, you know, their they're logical relationship, a place like Benabara, and the sort of ethos that's behind an organisation and the history that's behind an organisation like the Royal Geographical Society of Queensland. So I'm delighted that we're able to reconnect and um, look at things that are mutually rewarding for both organisations. And also then bring in the, also the National Parks Association of Queensland, that's my other hat. <laughs> of course. Well, thank with you. that, everyone, thank you so much for coming online tonight. This video and the recording will be made available very soon. And keep an eye out for our next lecture in a month's time. Good night, everyone. Thank you.